too terribly hot today. But the gnats have forced me to come out and work in the garden in the middle of the day. So we are, huh, we shouldn't bring this stuff in. <laughs> we are seeding the um, garlic bed that I harvested the other day. I'm gonna show you what I'm planting. I have so much garlic here. <laughs> I, I haven't counted how many bulbs I harvested, um, but it's a lot. I don't know what I'm gonna do with all this. But everything's been taken out and this right here, these ones are the ones I pulled out with you guys on the video. This is the Creole variety. They're just about dry, but not all the way. And then I have the Red Russian and the Nutka Rose that I just harvested like two days ago. And so these should be here drying for a couple more weeks. But quite soon after I harvested the garlic, I ended up reseeding that whole bed with okra and some beans. And the okra that I planted was this burgundy okra from groworganic.com, Peaceful Valley Farm. I've never tried this okra. I've grown, I don't even know, Clemson spineless maybe. It was a green version last year and it was only a few plants. But I got these seeds this, this year. So I wanted to try them out. And then interspaced with the okra, I just put my saved bean seeds, my bush bean seeds that I have in the bean garden over there and just basically threw a ton of seeds in this bed. So when I was finished harvesting all the garlic, here are two onions that I had thrown into this bed halfway through the season because I ran out of room in my onion bed. I'm gonna let them keep going, they're not doing any harm. And this right here is a touch of red buff calendula, which looks pretty worse for wear. I'm not sure what the issue is. Uh, but it's still producing flowers, so that's good. And then right here are two tomatoes that I'm going to trellis up against this bean trellis here as they grow. But after I took all the garlic out, I just put down a, a layer of fertilizer and then another bag of soil and then re-layered the mulch over the top. And then from there I just put little holes in the mulch and seeded my plants. So just okra and beans are going to be in this bed. Cross your fingers that they come up and that's what we're doing today. We are adding diatomaceous earth to the tops of these holes because I have a major problem with roly polies eating my sprouts. And I'm still having a huge problem with these gnats in the middle of the day. <laughs> it doesn't help that I'm in the garden because there's tons of greenery and there's a shade cloth and it's just right. It's not windy today. Uh, I wish they were done. <laughs> I wish they weren't here anymore. And usually in the early spring, I don't have too much of a problem seeding directly in the ground. As long as it's cool enough, it's still getting pretty low at night. Not low enough to kill seedlings, but low enough that the bugs aren't out yet. But here we are smack dab in the middle of spring. Feels like summer. And these roly polies are out and about and everywhere. So if I want any of these seedlings to come up, I'm going to need to do a little bit more than just exposing the dirt to sunlight. And that's where this diatomaceous earth comes in. So I've left the spots where I seeded, I left them open, which is problematic in the desert because they tend to dry out more. But I'm also, I also placed a water over each of these holes and I'm watering in the middle of the day so that they stay moist so that the seeds can germinate. And what I'm just gonna do is come along and put diatomaceous earth over each one of these holes to hopefully deter the roly polies from snatching up my seedlings. Now this isn't a foolproof method. Um, diatomaceous earth hurts bugs or kills bugs with exoskeletons because this tiny little powder, which is really bad to breathe in, actually gets into underneath their exoskeleton. It's like little shards of glass piercing them. 
I don't think it will kill the roly polies, but hopefully it will deter them. I haven't had huge luck with diatomaceous earth in the past, um, but that's all I've got. <laughs> I didn't plant this bed with any sort of rhyme or reason. I just, re after I was done mulching it, I just relayed the strip system down and basically made a hole for a plant wherever there was an emitter. <laughs> so, uh, I think the okra is equally spaced apart because it gets rather large and you don't want them crowding each other. And then I just threw beans in, in between the okra in intervals wherever an emitter was. So for now, we'll have to see if that works because with the heat and me keeping this watered, I should see seedlings starting to come up within uh, like two or three days, hopefully. So I wanted to make sure and get out here and put this diatomaceous earth down before seedlings popped up because those roly polies will just, the first hint of green coming out of the soil, they will just eat that whole thing right down. The one issue with using diatomaceous earth and watering is that see how that is crumbly and powder this is wet this is wet because i just watered this area and diatomaceous earth is not effective when it is wet uh, but as soon as it dries as, as soon as the top of the soil dries out it will be effective again just for the period that it stays wet it's not it, it won't do what it's supposed to do so that's the that's the balancing act I have <laughs> with trying to keep the soil moist enough to sprout a seedling and then also uh, hoping the diatomaceous earth works. Hmm, we'll find out. <laughs> I'm just hoping I put enough seeds in here that maybe they'll eat some of the seedlings and not get some of the others. When I harvested this first batch of garlic, I put like 10 okra seeds in here and I only had two come up which is fine I had two they survived they look like they're doing okay so we just got to keep that same energy <laughs> for the rest of the seedlings y'all look at this forest right here desert forest desert forest I love it and this Tahitian melon plant is like my favorite place in the whole garden. Look at this. This is so cool. And these leaves are huge. They even have some baby Tahitian melons growing. So the Tahitian melon looks a lot like a tromboncino squash, which I'll show you in a second. But this is meant to be a winter squash. So this is going to get very large, larger than this. And then the outside rind will turn brown and harden and it actually tastes a lot like a butternut squash. So we're gonna wait until this gets nice and large and brown on the outside. You wanna make sure the rind is hard enough that your nail can't pierce it and then it's ready to store all winter long. But the tromboncino squash can be used as either a winter squash or a summer squash like a zucchini. And here in this jungle, we have the tromboncino squash. There's one little guy. And there's another that's curled. They actually take on a more elongated form if you trellis them like I did the Tahitian melons, but I ran out of trellises. But I'm going to be harvesting some of these tromboncinos early and testing them out as a summer squash as like a zucchini and then I will also be leaving a couple to um, completely mature and harden as a winter squash not only because I want to save seeds but obviously I want to try it both ways and see which way I like better and this guy's still got a while to go you can harvest them this early but you're just not going to get as much food out of them and <laughs> This is, this is an odd shape, but it can't be helped because I don't have a trellis. So if they're laying on the ground, they will end up curling around like this because they just keep growing long 
and run into things that turn them. Like that, this stem right here probably made this guy curve just like that. Everything else in the garden is looking pretty good. I do have my eye on one tomato, which I think may have gotten hit by a um, beet leaf hopper and has curly top. And he's pretty big. It's a little disappointing. But this one is starting to show early signs of curly top, which I'm just especially watching out for because it's been such a problem in my garden. I've got a bunch of curling leaves right here, which normally would just be heat stress, but the same tomatoes aren't doing it everywhere else. And then up here, you see the slight yellowing and the curling of these leaves. And see, in general, these leaves are all curved upwards in contrast to these guys who are flat leafed and pretty despite being in the same location. So this one does have some fruit on it which will absolutely ripen if it does have curly top. It's just a little disappointing. I got hit late on this plant. I thought I thought the beet leaf hoppers had made their way through and taken all the plants they were going to take with them. But I must have had a stray guy come in and take a bite <laughs> cuz this one looks like it's it's going to be done too. But that's okay. I'll get over it. I've got lots of tomatoes, lots of tomato plants, and I'm already harvesting peppers and tons of squash, uh, summer squash from the garden. I've cut, harvested, I think, three yellow squash, one rondonese. I have several more yellow squash coming up. Tons of peppers coming. <laughs> this cute little bell peppers still coming. You can harvest them at this size, at this age. Um, they'll just be green, but technically they're supposed to turn to a chocolate brown. And in this tomato bed, I finally have my first ripening tomato. Which I'm convinced now this is going to be the chocolate pear tomato that I had labeled wrong. But this will be my first red tomato of the year. And I cannot be more excited. I think it's got a couple more days to go. It's not supposed to get to like a really, really dark brown. More of like a, like a burnished brownish red but it's still got a bit of green on the bottom and I want to make sure it's completely ripe when I harvest it because I want it to taste amazing as my first tomato of the season. My Corolla potatoes are still going strong and have not even started losing their flowers much less dying back. They are taking quite a bit longer than I thought they would but I have several potatoes here that are falling sick and diseased and I think I'm probably going to harvest these guys because I don't want the disease to spread I don't know what it is I just don't want it to spread anywhere else and I'd rather just get these guys out of the ground and eat the little tiny potatoes as new potatoes rather than lose my entire crop of potatoes <laughs> look at my sunflowers how crazy are these guys this is one two three for five plants. This is five sunflower plants. These are amazing, aren't they? I can't get over it. And I keep coming through here and deadheading them so that they keep blooming. We need to come through here with some pruners though because there's ants all over them. The ants love the sunflowers for some reason. I don't know why. And they're the, they're the big ants, not the little sugar ants. <laughs> they actually bite. I also pulled up a couple more onions that were ready. They were the Violet de Galmi, the red ones again. And then I just reseeded like I did in the garlic bed with beans at various intervals. And I think for the most part, this bed is going to be bush beans because my bean field isn't doing the greatest, which is fine. Uh, but I, I want more beans. I like, I love storing dried beans. I have a five gallon bucket of dried beans that I purchased inside the house. <laughs> It would be greater if I grew them myself, and that's what we're trying to do this year. So I've got the okra and a few beans in the garlic bed, and I think the onion bed is going to be mostly beans whenever I get those onions out. <sighs> All right, guys, I have overstayed my welcome with these gnats. Done what I need to do, and I'm going to go back inside <laughs> and 
hopefully these guys will be gone soon. Thank you for joining me. I'll catch you on the next one.